What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. Amron, we had our top 24 running back ranking summit yesterday. But I got to be honest with you guys, that took way too long. Was recording for like an hour, had like 12 pages of notes I had to go through. So I decided after spending literally, it took me more than a day to outline that whole video. And I really wanted to give you guys the top 24 because I think no one else is doing that all in one video. But then I sat down put pen to paper for this wide receiver video got to seven pages only got through 12 wide receivers and i was like okay this is enough we'll split it into two fine so we're going to go with our top 12 wide receivers in ppr leagues for this video in a tier list format so i have these broken down by tiers s tier a tier b tier all of that because this far out that's all i'm really confident in at this point i'm willing to say that i will probably be wrong and by august a lot of this is going to be jumbled but this is an early look at my rankings we're gonna do a part two so i'm gonna i'll stop the video i'm gonna write the rest of the outline today record later and then that'll go up on like wednesday or thursday of the rest of the top 24 on pretty much the same tier list so with that being said if you enjoy the video make sure you go down below leave a like subscribe let's go thirsty thirsty trying to choose i mean i know i'm critical my nitty baby now, a little bit of a disclaimer with these ranks. I did this yesterday, but these are not going to be consensus. This is not just me looking at ADP and making just tier base within the ADP. This is me looking at the wide receivers in a vacuum. This is how I would rank them in PPR leagues. Now, this is not the order that I would pick them in PPR leagues because, as you guys know, I draft by ADP. I'm not reaching more than half a round. When you play in as many leagues as I do, you don't have to do that. You can get better prices elsewhere. There's no reason to, you know, force the issue on players that you like. So, with that being said... Let's talk about our wide receiver one, Cooper Cup. Pretty easy choice. Oh, I'm an idiot. I didn't put the, the tier list graphic up, but we have Cooper Cup at wide receiver one. He's coming off genuinely the most dominant wide receiver season we have ever seen. I don't have, more, I don't have any data past the last 10 years, but in the last, like, since 2015, at the very least, it is the most dominant wide receiver season we've ever seen. Uh, maybe like Randy Moss did something crazy before then, maybe Jerry Rice did, but as far as the modern era of me playing fantasy football, I have never seen anything like what, Christian McC what Cooper Cup did last year. He was the Christian McCaffrey of wide receivers. I talk about this all the time. I talked about it all la last offseason. We have the, the, the advantage you get with running backs over wide receiver in the first round is that running backs have this crazy ceiling where they can have that M McCaffrey, Todd Gurley, um... Who are the other guys? But like David Johnson, Le'Veon Bell type seasons where if your league taco had them, they probably made it to the finals and they probably made it to the championship. We've only ever seen running backs put up 25% plus win rates. Now this is best ball win rates, thousands of leagues. And yes, you can say, oh, it doesn't matter because it's best ball, but it does. It's just a way of calculating a player's importance across thousands of leagues you can't get information from thousands of leagues when it's redraft and there's so many different parts and trades and you know just 12 year olds running up a league on espn you don't have data for this kind of stuff outside of the adecos of the world that can scrape sleeper adp and come up with win rate data but for this 8.3 percent is the average win rate right one divided by 12 8.33333 repeated Cooper Cup had a 32.9 percent win rate last year the second craziest win rate we have ever seen in an entire season ever and not only that but it was the first time a wide receiver ever put up a legendary win rate above 25 percent now part of that was because the running backs were so bad last year we didn't have like a 25 point per game guy at running back but as a wide receiver he put up over 400 ppr points now he did it in 17 games but we've never seen a player put up over 400 ppr points as a skill position player outside of mccaffrey once and david johnson before him just crazy he was like a 24 point per game guy he was the leading scorer in all of fantasy and ppr leagues just absolutely insane and i think this year you can project him for 20 21 points per game i don't think he's going to be out of his mind again where he puts up 400 plus points on the season i mean it's in the range of outcomes he's going to have a position where he's going to be out there on most of the routes he's going to have matthew stafford throwing the football sean mcveigh is going to be dialing up a fine offense they have alan robinson on the outside now who depends how you feel about Allen Robinson but he should take away at least some coverage uh on the outside but it's going to be very very interesting to see if he can repeat the only reservations I have about Cooper Cup is during his entire career you guys know that I love target share I love players that earn their volume if you can earn volume in the NFL 
then you can just you use that as a foundation and then efficiency will hit eventually and with cooper cup he's never been a big target hog guy during his entire career he's been around 21 and 23 percent target share last year he shot up to 31 percent if he maintains 30 percent again we're looking at 21 22 points per game if he if he regresses to the mean and gets to like 25 percent target share 24 percent target share that's a scary outcome if he hits like 27 28 29 percent target share that's also probably still fine so it's a little bit concerning that he's never been a super target dominant guy during his entire career uh until just last year but i doubt that that rapport with matthew stafford kind of just goes away entirely but that is just kind of the downside that a lot of cooper cup a lot of anti cooper cup guys that you'll see in dynasty sort of point to now when we go to wide receiver two we're going to talk about justin jefferson i got to be honest with you guys i think there's a really good chance that by august justin jefferson's like my wide receiver one i want to put him there so so bad man i want to put him there so bad he is just a guy where we just talked about cooper cup kind of he kind of did it out of nowhere but justin jefferson the minute that he stepped foot in the league it's just been a matter not of if but when he's just going to be the top wide receiver in the nfl and fantasy all of that stuff and he is now heading into year three on that upward trajectory where things are really going to start to peak now and just in just in year two last year after coming off a wide receiver nine point per game finish as a rookie putting up odell beckham type stat lines he was the wide receiver four in points per game last year he was a 30 percent target share guy so he was up there in terms of target share with Devonte adams and cooper cup again 30 percent target share in year two is insane he's commanding targets on a per route basis tied for fifth in targets per out run tied for fourth in yards per out run so he's not just commanding volume but he's really efficient on that he operates downfield he had the highest average depth of target among the top five wide receivers in targets per out run so he's not only commanding targets and being efficient he's commanding targets downfield he has an a dot of 13.2 yards downfield he is really special the talent is clear it's really just been that the offense has sort of stalled under kevin zimmer and the kubiak family in this run heavy slow pace type offense that they've run but now we should be very excited because I think that Kevin O'Connell coming in, who's coming from the Rams, who just unlocked Cooper Cup, not that Jefferson's like a slot wide receiver and plays the same way, but he is going to modernize the offense, right? Take them out of the Stone Age era and give them a modern offense where they go from having the 17th and 26th ranked neutral pace. What the hell? The last two years, the Vikings, this is a, a tweet from Hayden Winks that I am butchering currently, but the Vikings have been 17th and 26th in neutral pace and 16th and 26th in neutral pass rate since 2020. O'Connell's offenses have been top 12 in each of those years. So we are now getting into a spot where you're going to have an offense run a lot of plays, a lot more passing, really really exciting stuff for Jefferson you're also now getting another year into Adam Thielen's career where he could kind of decline a little bit they didn't bring in a wide receiver three so they're gonna run a lot more 11 personnel but you're just looking at KJ Osborne so there is a lot of opportunity for Justin Jefferson to make this jump to be a 22 23 point per game guy into the prime of his career now the next guy we'll talk about was his teammate at OSU Jamar Chase who was kind of like the Justin Jefferson of this year where he's heading into year two the the thing that kind of bums me out about Jamar Chase is that he'd probably still be here for me in my rankings, but I hate how the market hasn't, like, there's no discount on Jamar Chase at all, where if you remember last year, you had up top, you had Tyree Kill, Devontae Adams, Diggs, and then tier two was like DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, DeAndre Hopkins, Calvin Ridley, and then like Justin Jefferson, all in this next tier. We're not getting that with Jamar Chase. Jamar Chase isn't getting jumbled in there. He is already getting jumbled in with this top tier. So that might scare some people off. This is probably where I would have been comfortable taking him anyways. It just sucks that we're not getting value on him. You're pretty much taking him where he should be valued around that 106 spot. But Jamar Chase was insane last year. He turned 128 targets, only a 23.7% target share, which is a lot for a rookie, but compared to like Jefferson and Cup, not a ton. He turned that into 1,455 yards and 13 touchdowns on 128 targets like that is insane a wide receiver five point per game finish where jefferson was really sick his rookie year but was only a wide receiver nine point per game finish so chase has done something that we haven't seen since odell now odell was insane as a rookie jamar chase had 17.9 points per game odell had like 20 points per game as a rookie he was insane but i think a lot of casual analysts are going to point to jamar chase having like 18 yards per reception and 13 touchdowns and say okay he's going to regress why is our hair coming down I don't even know what the heck is going on. 
Um, but they're going to point to that and say, they're going to scream regression. They're going to say, oh, he got lucky. He got saw a lot of efficiency. There's like a piece of hair flying around. Okay, there we go. Now it's finally off. <laughs> all right. So, with Jamar Chase, they're going to point to all that. They're going to say, oh, T. Higgins is getting better. Tyler Boyd's still there. Um, and they're going to come up with a lot of excuses as to why Jamar Chase is going to slump here. A lot of you'll, you'll catch a lot of analysts. I see this on Twitter. I see this on YouTube a lot. They like, like, people love the word, like, sophomore slump or just, like, the term sophomore slump so much that they just, like, put it on players with no information to back it up. It's just like, he was too good to be true. Second year, he's going to suck. He's going to have a sophomore slump. And sophomore slumps happen, right? We saw what Chase Claypool last year. We kind of saw what Brandon Ayuk last year. But if you don't have any data to back up why that slump is going to happen, I think it's pretty lazy analysis. Now, when we go to Jamar Chase into year two, we know that year two wide receivers, like we just saw with Justin Jefferson, where I believe Justin Jefferson as a rookie was like a... I'm trying to remember, but I want to say he was like a 25% target share guy, 26% target share guy. We saw him climb up to 29.9% target share. We'll round it up to 30%. And with these rookie wide receivers, as you guys can see here, this is showing an average veteran wide receiver how much their target share and point per game change per year. And it, and it goes down, which makes sense for veteran wide receivers. And if you look at rookie wide receivers, from year one to year two, you see massive gains in points per game and in target share. So we can expect Jamar Chase to build on what he did last year just based off of recent trends. And he only saw a 23.7% target share last year. He has the profile where T. Higgins is there, so I don't think 30% target share is in his range, but he has the profile of this wide receiver who down the line is going to command 28, 29, 20, 30% type target shares. I think this year we're probably looking at like 26, 25, 27% target share in that range. So any efficiency concerns will be offset by his increase in volume as a rookie he is going to get more volume as he goes on and he's also just a very talented wide receiver i just want to bet on very good players in fantasy when we look at his success rates for cover versus coverage it's very clear he's talented he had an 81st percentile versus man 95th percentile versus press is on reception perception where he absolutely blew the doors off of everything as a rookie and you now have burrow coming in where burrow in this offense went from they were very pass happy when he was a rookie. He was like 40 pass attempts per game. He scaled back to 32 pass attempts per game last year. And they kind of eased him back into the offense. I think now in this third year for Burrow, where T. Higgins and Jamar Chase have been great, they're going to have a better offensive line, right? They bring in Leo Collins. It's going to be really exciting. I think that this offense could be fireworks. I think both of these wide receivers could finish. I mean, they're projected to both finish top 12 again. I think we will see another top five finish for Chase and top 12 finish for T. Higgins. Very bullish on both of them. Now we move to this next tier. I'm glad I slid this in the two part. We're already 12 minutes in and we've only talked about three players. But we're going to talk about Stefan Diggs. And he's going to be my wide receiver four in A tier. And he had a dis disappointing year last year. And I, I was pretty quick to want to be out on him. But there's some underlying data that kind of points to he should be getting a bounce back season here. He had a 16.8 points per game last year after a 20 point per game season the year prior. In his first year with Josh Allen, when he kind of lit the league on fire, was his first like standout year. I think he like set records in reception perception. He was really, really clean that year. And I don't think that he's just all of a sudden not as good a player anymore. He still commanded volume last year, 26.4% target share. He just had a down year in efficiency. And as we know, efficiency isn't sticky to sticky year to year. I'm going to make a video on this literally this week. Efficiency isn't sticky year to year. But over the entirety of a player's career, the good ones are the ones that see spikes in efficiency on a lot of volume. And we've already seen Diggs be efficient on a lot of volume. There's no reason to believe that he can't do it again. A lot of these, a lot of the efficiency metrics, they swing back and forth like a pendulum. It swung back this year. There's a good chance that it could swing back next year. When we look at the last two years for Stefan Diggs. So this first, the, the chart on top is from 2021. Last year, he had 18.6 expected points per game. X, X, the X point per game is just how much is he expected to score in terms of points per game just based off of his volume, where he was catching footballs, if it was like red zone targets, all of that. How, how much points should he be putting out? He underperformed that by minus 1.8 points per game that year. If you go to 2020, the year before that, when he did really well with Josh Allen, he had again about an 18 expected points per game but he outperformed it by 2.2 points per game for a 20.5 point per game output in 2020 so it's pretty easy to see that if he just hovers around the 18.5 expected points per game that as long as he doesn't suck and his efficiency is at least just right on par with 18.5 points per game you're looking at a top five wide receiver 
And if he outperforms that because Josh Allen's his quarterback and you can see a lot of efficiency in that offense, you're looking at a top three 20 plus point per game wide receiver. And I think when we're looking at these top wide receivers like Devontae Adams, Tyree Kill, all these 20 point per game type guys, they switch teams. They don't have that same rapport with their quarterbacks. They're also not catching passes from guys like Josh Allen. So Stephon Diggs is still somebody I'm very excited about after not giving a ton of love to him in the offseason. Now, moving on, we'll talk about Devontae Adams here. And Devontae Adams is really only behind Stephon Diggs because he switched teams again. So there's some uncertainty there. You have the sort of the, I don't want to say like the smut, but the, the, the stench of like what happened to Odell Beckham when he went to the Browns. DeAndre Hopkins hasn't worked out super, super great on the Cardinals. But I do think with this modern NFL where everyone's changing places, I think that worrying about players switching teams, especially wide receivers, will be a thing of the past. And with Devontae Adams, it's really important to note that I don't think he's lost a step at all. I think that he is still the best wide receiver in the league. It's tough because you can put Cooper Cup there now, but just in terms of being a wide receiver and doing it for a long time and just being out of his mind, he had a 31.6% target share last year, 21.5 points per game as the wide receiver two, was kind of outspoken for by Cooper Cup. I think that the people that, that rostered Devonta Adams knew how helpful he was last year and just getting into a finals spot, especially just how bad the first round was last year. I want to say he had like a 15% win rate, which is still strong. And especially last year when all you needed to do was just hit on your first round pick and not take a Saquon or McCaffrey, anything like that. But he had a monster target share. He smashed reception perception, 98th percentile against man, 96th percentile against zone, 99th percentile against press. He set the record in reception perception for most routes being double covered at over 22%. It's wild. So he is at the top of his game. He is as good as he's always been. He has a change of scenery, which is scary, but it's a little bit better than a random change of scenery because he's he's not going to... I'm a little bit more worried about Tyree Kill, who we'll talk about later, because he's going to a system with Tua, who is nowhere near the quarterback that Mahomes is and has no rapport at all with Tyree Kill. With Devontae Adams, Derek Carr is a big downgrade to Aaron Rodgers, but he's at least not like Tua or some unproven guy who can't throw the ball. He is Derek Carr, who is a fine NFL quarterback probably in the range of like a Kirk Cousins and he has rapport with Devontae Adams now as much it's a little bit tough to buy in but they did play together in college at Fresno State and Devontae Adams had insane years there so at least they have some kind of chemistry he wants to play it on the Raiders so it's a good spot for him now a lot of people are going to point to Waller and Renfro and I see a lot of takes that he's not going to command his usual 30 percent target share I'm not operating under that assumption if he had a 31.6 percent target share last year I imagine in this new spot, maybe 30% is too much, but 27, 28% probably sounds right. I think that he probably takes targets away from Waller and Renfro. Like I, the way that I sort of view a lot of these receiving situations is the top takes from the bottom instead of the bottom taking from the top. Like I don't see Waller and Renfro taking targets away from Devontae Adams to the point where he's at like a 23, 24% target share, which brings me to Mike Clay's projections. I bring them up a lot. He, his job at ESPN is to be as safe as possible, as conservative as possible. He just wants to be accurate. He has Devontae Adams as his wide receiver six on a 24% target share. Dude, 24 is really, really low. So what gets me excited about that is he has Devontae Adams missing a game and only on a 24% target share, and he's still his wide receiver six. So if you have Devontae Adams playing the full season and having a 28% target share, we're talking about a top three guy in the 22, in like the 20 point per game range, which is really exciting for a guy we're kind of getting an uncertainty discount on for going to the Raiders. I see a lot of guys, I've seen a couple ranks now where he, instead of being like, I have him around like probably like 109, 108. I see a lot of people out there that have him as like their 205, 206. So any kind of, if you can get Devontae Adams at the one, two turn, I think that that will be a great process bet this season. Now the last wide receiver in this tier that I don't really understand the pessimism on Debo and why people don't consider him in the same tier after a 21 point per game season where I might have been wrong on Devontae. Debo might have had more points per game than him, but all I know is that they were close. They both had like around 21 points per game, which is really strong. For wide receivers, if we can get over 20 points per game, they are giving you as much wins above replacement as like a top running back. It's really strong. And people seem to really knock Debo for his rushing, and they think a lot of his points come off of rushing, and he complained about that this offseason. So if they take away his rushing rule, he's not going to be good for fantasy. And I don't think that I think that that could be I don't think that could be further from the truth. This is a great tweet. Nope. What do we got? Yep, this is a great tweet from John Daigle. Where, if you look at the splits, before Elijah Mitchell got hurt, 
they utilize Debo Samuel as a genuine wide receiver. Now, of course, he got six carries, but he wasn't used over the first eight games. He didn't even have he didn't even average a carry per game. Over this first eight games, he had six total carries. He had a 31.5% target share, 10.1 targets per game, 21.1 fantasy points per game. Now, if you go to week 10 and on, that's when he sort of reverted to his wide back role, where he had 7.2 carries per game, 18.8% target share per game, 4.9 targets per game, 19.9 fantasy points per game. So it was worse for him in fantasy. And I think that him getting less of that w- role of being this wide back that takes carries out of the backfield is good for him in fantasy. He's already shown that he can be a very good football player just in terms of a, a stand-up wide receiver in the NFL. He can operate in that role, command a 30% target share, and be amazing. I don't think that we can project him a 30% target share this year, but I think 24 to 26, 27% target share range will still be fine. He is a monster efficiency guy, and I know it's tough to bet on efficiency year to year, but with a guy like Debo Samuel, I'm just very confident that he is a really, really strong player. He is very good, man. He he just rips off. Like The thing that I love about him is that he can win in either of these two roles. So however Kyle Shanahan wants to use him, he can thrive in both of them because he's good at football. He makes plays. He breaks off these huge runs. He just does things that a lot of players can't do at the wide receiver position there's some uncertainty there with the new quarterback there's some uncertainty there with Ayuk not being in the doghouse but I still do believe that Debo Samuel should be in consideration in the same tier as a Diggs in the same tier as a Devontae Adams as a wide receiver that you can project for about 18 points per game that has a ceiling of 20 21 22 points per game and I, I actually want to show Mike Clay hasn't projected Mike Clay hasn't projected for a 20 percent target show so that would be really bad so he Mike Clay seems to think that all of Debo Samuel complaining in the offseason isn't going to actually work out for him that he's going to have 94 carries, 584 yards rushing. I tend to disagree, but even in that role of him running the ball a lot, he would be the wide receiver four. So we now we have two sets of data data where Clay thinks he's going to be wide back, still a top five wide receiver. And we saw over the first eight games that they just used him as a traditional wide receiver. He's looking, he had 21 points per game. Now I think that that scales back to probably like 18 points per game, a little bit more on the median. I think he's upside for 20 plus, but we now, we now have two paths for Debo to go down. Both of them he can be fine for in fantasy. I prefer the normal wide receiver role for Debo, but again, he kind of has that covered on both sides. Now we're going to talk about this next tier. And I don't think you guys are going to be happy that I have this guy this high. But again, I've said this week in, week out on this channel. We are going to be betting very heavily on not only just the Eagles offense, but A.J. Brown. Off rip, A.J. Brown one of the most talented wide receivers in the NFL. He is insane. Ever since he has stepped foot in the NFL, he has been very good. He had a 27% target share last year. He had a 26% target share in his second year. He's only been in the, in the league three years. And in his first three years, he was fifth, second, and fifth in yards per route run. He commands targets at a high rate. He is efficient on those targets. That's all I'm looking for. I want you to be able to command targets. And then what you do after the catch is great. AJ Brown's is big 220 pound wide receiver where he can operate in this area of the field where he can just get a a deep ball and go up against like a two like a 190 pound corner and just shrug him off and go for a touchdown he is amazing he is one of only three wide receivers last year that on a per route basis again remember he missed some time he had some injury concerns so that 27 percent target share isn't super super accurate of what he's had just because he's had some games where his routes were limited his snap share was limited but on a per route basis he was one of only three wide receivers along with Devontae Adams, Cooper Cup, and A.J. Brown of players that had over a 30% target share on a per route basis. So he had a 30% target per route run, only other player with above 30% besides Devontae Adams, Cooper Cup. He is that good at commanding targets, and he was only in year three last year. He also stood out on reception perception. He had a 96 percentile win rate against man, 98th percentile against press only behind Devonte Adams in both of those categories. He is at the top of his game. He dealt with some injuries last year, but there is no mistake. AJ Brown is a dog. He, in terms of talent, in my eyes, he, he belongs in these tiers. He's only down here because of situation. Now, when we talk about situation, he gets traded from the Titans to the Eagles. And I think people are tra- treating that move unfairly because I think that we would be picking him in this area or even where I have him here, where it's a little bit higher than consensus, if he just stayed on the Titans, if he was in the same situation as he was last year. But he goes to the Eagles. And sure, they're both run-first offenses, but the Eagles have more upside to be pass-heavy than the Titans. The the Eagles at running back, they have Miles Sanders, Boston Scott, Kenneth Gainwell, and Kennedy Brooks, who they took as an undrafted free agent. On the Titans, they have Derrick Henry, top three running back in the league. The Titans are much more incentivized to run the ball than the Eagles are. And the Eagles' front office 
is run by Howie Roseman, who's really sharp, uses analytics, traded for AJ Brown, didn't make any moves to improve the run game in the draft. And we've also now caught a glimpse of head coach Sirianni and what he wanted to do when he got into the league. And I've told you guys a million times, you're going to get sick of seeing this graphic. This was through the first six weeks when Sirianni came in and he installed the offense that he wanted to run. They were fifth highest in passing volume in neutral game scripts. So not in garbage time, third and longs, in neutral situations, they were fifth in highest passing volume. And you see a lot of really good offenses up there. You see the Bills, the Chiefs, the Chargers, the Buccaneers, the Raiders. If they keep this up, if they decide to come into this year where I truly do believe that they trade for A.J. Brown so they can set up an offense like this, where they wanted to install an offense like this, but you can't when you are throwing to rookie Devonta Smith, J.J. Arcega-Whiteside, Jalen Rager, they didn't have the weapons for it. Well, now they do. They have A.J. Brown, Devonta Smith, Dallas Goddard. That will get it done for this kind of offense, and it's going to come down to Jalen Hurts. I'm of the idea that I think that Jalen Hurts can thrive in that kind of offense. He's going to have weapons. He's been good uh, over his what his first 18 starts. I think he still has more room to grow. And if they run an offense like this, where they pass the ball a ton, and A.J. Brown still commands 27 28% target share, it's wraps. He's going to be a top five wide receiver, 20 plus points per game. He's just somebody that I want to be betting on. So if they revert back to this, it is absolutely wheels up for A.J. Brown. And if they don't, you're looking at A.J. Brown and the offense that he's been in this entire time. A run first offense on the Titans where he wins on monster efficiency because that is what he does. So I think that his floor is high. I think his ceiling is high. All it really just comes down to is injury. And I'm not somebody that's going to shy away from injuries in the NFL. Now, the next wide receiver we'll talk about is C.D. Lamb. And he's my wide receiver eight. His 2022 projection kind of just comes down to this. We're still waiting on a top 12 finish from him. He has not finished in the top 12. He has not given us a dominant season. I drafted him a lot last year, and he didn't really give you anything great. I think he finishes around like the wide receiver 18. But all, all signs point to him smashing this year, and I can agree with it. Amari Cooper leaves. CeeDee Lamb's now the number one option in Dallas. And I usually revert to targets are earned, so I don't really care who the competition is around you. But the competition around him was sort of forcing him to be the slot wide receiver and have like an 80% target share or an 80% route per participation rate. So what ended up happening was is that he only had a 20.4% target share last year, which was 36th. But on a per route basis, he was actually commanding targets at a pretty good rate. He had a 24% target per route run, which was the same target per route run that T Higgins had at a 24% target share. So if you assume this year with Amari Cooper gone, that CeeDee Lamb is going to be on the field for 95 plus percent of the targets, then we're probably looking at 23 24% target share at the very worst. And if he does take this year three monster jump like Debo did last year, where he had a 31% target share, I'm not saying CD is going to have that, but he has the upside to really put up a monster target share if he's as good as a lot of you guys think that he is. So if he makes a top, if he makes a jump in target share, he's going to pretty easily be in the conversation as a top five breakout type candidate. Also, you pull up those wide receiver projections. I wonder if I, if, if I have him on that list. No, but I want to say he's like wide receiver seven on Mike Clay's projections with only like a 21% target share. So he's a lot of room to improve on that. If his target share goes up, he could be a top five guy pretty easily. But again, he has a lot of projection here. Now, when we go on to wide receiver nine, last wide receiver in this tier, we're talking about T. Higgins. And T. Higgins showed how talented he was last year against a rookie wide receiver chase. He had a top 12 season, 15.7 points per game. Even after this weird, if you guys remember, I, I had T. Higgins on a lot of teams through the first six weeks it was rough like he was he was dealing with an injury he was getting he was getting out there he was commanding targets the points just weren't coming the points came like week seven and on but even with dealing with injuries and all that he finished top 12 he had a strong target share at 24 percent. he had a strong yards per out run he was eighth in yards per out run so he's just efficient and he doesn't win on a uh, he doesn't win on efficiency like aj brown does with yards after the catch he wins on efficiency as being this downfield pass catcher that makes plays down the field so that's an interesting nugget that he wins down the field as his deep playmaker. He wins in contested catch situations as well. He only had six touchdowns in 14 games to Jamar Chase's 13 and 17 games. He was also tackled on the one yard line four times, T. Higgins. So he's due for some touchdown luck. If that if that touchdown number went from like six to ten last year, we're talking about a guy who's like wide receiver eight, wide receiver nine. So I believe that Higgins is still going to get his 24 to 25% target share. He's still going to be efficient. He's going to operate downfield. And the real upside is that this offense is going to change a little bit in 2021 or 22, where last year they 
were only 20th in pass attempts per game. They went from like 32 pass attempts. They went from like 40 pass attempts per game with Joe Burrow in his rookie year to like 32. I think they wanted to ease Joe Burrow back in a little bit, try some different things out with the offense. They didn't know how Jamar Chase was going to be in year one. But after they eased Joe Burrow back in weeks one through three, and you look at weeks four through the Super Bowl, they were seventh in neutral game pass rate. So if that pass number goes up and they go from the 20th team in pass attempts per game and they go to like a top 10, top five type number, the amount of volume that T Higgins and Chase would both be able to see, it would be genuinely wild what kind of production that offense could put up. You could see Joe Burrow pass for like 40 touchdowns and both of the wide receivers both be great for fantasy. Now let's move on to this last tier. And the first guy here, we'll talk about Tyree Kill. And I know Tyree Kill in ADP is going ahead of AJ Brown and T Higgins. But this tier of wide receivers really scares me as bets at the 2-3 turn. And Tyree Kill is scary because he now goes from catching passes from Patrick Mahomes to catching passes from Tua. Which is really tough because Tyree Kill isn't like the top guys like Devontae Adams and Cooper Cup where he has like this 30% target share and just is a target magnet. He wins a lot on efficiency from his speed, from Mahomes' pass attempts. And when you take Mahomes out of that equation and you put Tua in there, who we're not sure he's even a good quarterback, if he's even a good NFL quarterback, a lot of uncertainty there. It's tough. Tyreek is 28 years old now. And the sad part about his game is that he's so special because of that long speed. And there's genuinely no one that can catch up with him. But again, he's now 28. The minute that speed comes down, I'm not sure he's like Antonio Brown in terms of winning without just his physical gifts, right? Where he can kind of be this technician now. Maybe he transition in, transitions into that, but I don't want to have to bet on that at like wide receiver seven or eight type prices. So for me, I'm good on him. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying that at 28, it's time to start worrying, especially after last year where he was catching passes from Mahomes and his efficiency actually took a dip for the first time in his entire career. And Tyreek Hill's interesting because people claim that efficiency isn't sticky year to year, which it isn't. But I think over a player's entire career, it's somewhat indicative of their talent. Because if you look at Tyreek Hill through his first one, two, three, four, five seasons, he ranked top 10 in fantasy points over expected per game. He was outproducing. I mean, he had a second a, a, a wide receiver two finish, a wide receiver three finish, a wide receiver two finish. In terms of efficiency, Tyreek Hill has been an absolute monster through five years. In year six last year, it was not only the first time that he ranked outside the top 10, but he ranked 41st among all wide receivers, only 1.2. So he was still somewhat efficient, but he wasn't at the same level that he's been, which is scary. When you're looking at a 28-year-old wide receiver coming off pretty much one of their worst seasons in recent memory, it gets tough to want to bet on that player. He could bounce back. I'm not looking to really bet against him. I take him in some spots when you know the B tier is all gone at wide receiver. He's just not somebody that I love to make a bet on. He, he, there's just some signs here where if the speed bottoms out, if Tua can't support him, if he can't be efficient in this offense, things get ugly for Tyree Kill pretty quickly. But I, I guess on the positive side, you can kind of be optimistic that McDaniel makes a good offensive game plan and kind of schemes some touches like they did Debo last year. And that would be really interesting. Now, wide receiver 11, we have Mike Evans. And Mike Le Evans is also a similar guy where I'm not dying to draft him. I know there's a lot of positive, uh, there's a lot of positive buzz around Mike Evans where he goes like, I think he goes like 206, 207 in, in underdog ahead of T Higgins, AJ Brown, and Tyree Kill. To me, Mike Evans feels like kind of a floor play. And I know a lot of people love him because the Bucks are going to have Godwin gone and they're going to really only have Russell Gage to compete for targets. Gronk isn't signed yet. So they're just like, Tom Brady has no one else to pass to. Mike Evans is going to be great. The issue is, I think Mike Evans is probably, at this point in his career, he's probably just good for locking in like a thousand yard season, a fringe wide receiver one season. That's probably what you get out of him. And I know that that's a lot to say, but when you look over his entire career, he used to be a target magnet like Devontae Adams and like Cooper Cup, but he hasn't been in a while. He went from 24% target share in his rookie year, which is just insane in a rookie year, to 29.5% to 29.9%. So he was this dominant target hog, 30% type guy. 2017 goes on to 24, then 22, then 24. And then the last two years, he's been at 17% and 17%. I think it's a really big stretch to say that now that Godwin is going to be gone for those first six weeks, that we should see Mike Evans 
go back to being a 25 26 27 percent target share type guy i i just can't see it he's more of this downfield touchdown air yards type guy not really the target hog he used to be so he is a pretty good lock for like 75 to 80 catches like a thousand to 1200 yards and like 13 to 15 touchdowns which sounds really good but only ends up in ppr leagues around like wide receiver nine wide receiver 10 with like 17 to 18 points per game 16 points per game somewhere around there it's just tough i would probably project him around like a 19 to 22 percent target share which is probably decent but i i don't see how he gets to like 20 plus points per game type numbers without a 25 percent or better target share so without that being in his range i just don't want to pay this price on mike evans but i can't knock people that are sort of chasing the ceiling on this offense and think that i mean if mike evans goes back to his old days and commands a 25 percent target share on this offense and you're looking at a top five wide receiver next up we'll talk about keenan allen i don't really think he's considered in the same tier but for me he is especially in ppr last year 106 receptions was the wide receiver 11 in points per game literally right next to mike evans mike evans is wide receiver 10 keenan allen's wide receiver 11 they were split by like 0.3 point per game uh keenan allen still commands targets he was 13th in targets per out run again 106 receptions he's tied to justin herbert who is going to be an absolute monster for years to come so i think this year this offense should be great justin herbert's going to be throwing the ball keenan allen will be fine again another floor, floor play but you're not paying the same price that you're paying for a mike evans with you know you can get him like a, a one and a half to like two rounds later than mike evans now i do call keenan allen a floor play and he's pretty unanimously called a floor play but we did call cooper cup in the same range last year of floor play and he kind of just came out of nowhere and was amazing i'm not saying keenan allen can do that but it's i'm not saying it's in his range of I don't know. I'm saying it's kind of in the range. I'm not I'm not betting on Keenan Allen to be this year's Cooper Cup, but if there was this like slot PPR guy that just like came out of nowhere because of like quarterback play and stuff, it would be it would be Keenan Allen. I think that he's like three or four years older than Cooper Cup, so it's a pretty bad comparison, but I'm just saying he has a similar archetype. Now that is going to do it for, for part one, which came out to 36 minutes, so that was a good call by me. I'm going to pretty much leave the t- this this exactly the same and then when we when I resume recording later on. I'm just going to start from here and just start from D tier and go down. So with that being said, as always, I love you guys. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you go down below, subscribe, leave a like. If you disagree with anything that I've said so far, feel free to go down below and drop a comment and disagree with me and maybe I'll uh, get into a civilized discussion with you down there. Uh, But as always, if you enjoyed the video, make sure you go down below, subscribe, leave a like, and I will see you guys in the next one. I got the juice, I got the juice. Ten oak, Chatham's on. Foolies glad I'm on. Even my haters kinda glad I'm on. Rest in peace to my bag up on. Rapper song, singer, suspended subpoena from Mr. Mean.